Hi, welcome back. It's good to be with you again. I'm going to begin today by reading you a literary reading um, from a paragraph from a famous book. Take a listen to this. It was the best of times. It was the worst of times. It was the age of wisdom. It was the age of foolishness. It was the epoch of belief. It was the epoch of incredulity. It was the season of light. It was the season of darkness. It was the season of hope. It was the winter of despair. We had everything before us, and we had nothing before us. We were all going directly to heaven. We were all going directly the other way. So can you guess what novel this paragraph is from? This is the opening words from A Tale of Two Cities by Charles Dickens. Most of us have heard this paragraph or these words before, even if we haven't read this book because there are just some pieces of culture that make an impact, and this is one of them. Because this paragraph written back in the mid-1800s represents the timeless dichotomy of the conflicts of life. We can identify with the contrasts that are mentioned here. There are days when it feels like the best time of our life, and that same day can just instantly become the worst. We have seen areas of hope and despair and light and darkness, and they come at us at all times. As believers in Christ, we know we have everything before us, and yet nothing before us is truly ours. We have days where our salvation is assured, and then moments where it feels like we're sure our ticket is pouched for southbound. So today we're bringing to close our series on the fruits of the spirit. And we do so by acknowledging that there is a spiritual conflict within us. And to live by the spirit is always at odds with our desire to live by the flesh. So as a result, we find ourselves living in the best and the worst of times. As you prepare to hear God's word, ask the spirit within you to reveal the conflict in your heart. Allow God to plant his hope for you there today. Now, we have spent the entire summer taking a deep dive into the fruit of the Spirit. And we are all familiar with these fruits as much as we are with, like, the opening of A Tale of Two Cities. We've heard them over and over. But we don't really understand the enormity of the power available to us through these fruits. Now, did you know that grapes on a vine do not all mature at the same time? The grapes at the top always mature first. Then eventually the fruit below also ripens and matures. The fruit of the Spirit acts in a very similar way in our lives. Not all of the fruit matures at the same time. But as one fruit matures, others begin to develop as well. You may have felt that as we studied these fruits, that the further down the list we got, the less success you were having. And that makes sense because of our fruit of the spirit matures top down. If we haven't matured one fruit, it will hinder the growth of another. God designed us so that love is the blossom. And without love, it's not possible for any of the other fruits to develop at all. Joy is when our love rejoices. Real joy is possible because we know what love is. Patience is our love enduring. As long as love develops that joy within us, that somehow develops patience and gives us strength that we didn't have. And peace is when our love trusts and we produce patience because we lean on peace. Kindness is our love serving. Love brings joy, patience, and peace, and it opens our heart to kindness. Goodness is our love reaching out. When love produces kindness to serve others, goodness develops. And faithfulness is our love proving itself. Love helps us follow through regardless of the costs. And gentleness is a touching love. A faithful love produces gentleness in us. And lastly, self-control is our love restraining. It's not using all of the power we have, but gaining self-control over ourselves as we mature in the fruits. Now that's how it's supposed to work anyways, when we're obedient to the spirit instead of the flesh. But our problem lies in that each one of these characteristics, each one of these fruits has an opposite that is sinful. A 
And those opposites are in direct conflict with the characteristics that we need to be like Christ. And we live in a constant struggle between doing what we know is good and right and what is easy, simple, and sinful. Now we're going back to Galatians 5 today where this began. We're revisiting Paul's letter to describe the purpose of the fruits of the Spirit. This passage is as timeless as the Dickens one was. One thing that has not changed over time is our struggle with the good and evil inside of us. And Paul is offering us a lifeline in our struggle with how we are to walk in life. So I'm going to read today from Galatians 5, 16 through 26. Paul says, So I say, walk by the Spirit, and you will not gratify the desires of the flesh. For the flesh desires what is contrary to the Spirit, and the Spirit what is contrary to the flesh. They are in conflict with each other, so that you're not to do whatever you want. But if you are led by the Spirit, you are not under the law. The acts of the flesh are obvious, sexual immorality, impurity and debauchery, idolatry and witchcraft, hatred, discord, jealousy, fits of rage, selfish ambition, dissension, factions and envy, drunkenness, orgies and the like. I warn you as I did before that those who live like this will not inherit the kingdom of God. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Against such things there is no law. Those who belong to Christ Jesus have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. Since we live by the Spirit, let us keep in step with the Spirit. Let us not become conceited, provoking, and envying each other. Paul begins here, this portion of the letter, by giving us tangible help to win our struggle in what to do is right. Walk by the Spirit. Because of sin, we are constantly in pursuit of what makes us feel good, right? But usually, as we said, these things that we are chasing are not usually good for us. Or we do them in excess and turn them into sins because of our lack of self-control. In any case, these Desires are in conflict with the spirit inside of us. So as you're walking around living your life, there's a battle going on inside of you, a real war. And as long as you live, you're going to experience this conflict. It is inescapable. Say you're standing in line at Walmart for a moment and you notice somebody who is dressed, let's say, not so mainstream. And your mind immediately races to judge, right? Your sinful nature is on alert, ready for moments just like this. And you think all kinds of judgmental thoughts from their hair to their shoes with such righteous indignation. And the spirit, unfortunately, doesn't even get our attention until after we've indulged in all of these evil thoughts. What if we had allowed the spirit to lead in that moment? Perhaps we would have stopped and thought before jumping to conclusions. And maybe instead of declaring somebody a weirdo, we could understand that maybe it's somebody who's been sick and is barely able to get out and get the supplies they need. Or maybe it's somebody who's been caring for somebody else for days that is sick. Or maybe this person dresses in an outlandish way because otherwise they're invisible. Nobody notices them. Or maybe they dress this way simply because they don't have the means, and this is what works. The problem is that our sinful desires are louder, they're bigger, they're more aggressive than the Spirit's desires. And they are again in opposite direction and conflict with what the Spirit desires within us. And we can't just stick our heads in the sand, we have to deal with the struggles that we face. And being judgmental is just one of the many sins we struggle with every single day. So Paul lists them out for us. In case we have any, any doubt about what they may be, he gives us an exhausted list of these sins. In Galatians 5, 19 through 21, Paul says, look at what you can accomplish if you let your sinful nature run wild. And while this list may just look like a random laundry list to you that Paul has thrown together, it's a very deliberate list. There are four categories of sins listed here that we struggle with in our human experience. 
And the first type of sins that Paul mentions are sexual sins, immorality, impurity, debauchery. Now, the word that Paul uses from the Greek here in his letter is the word pornea, which we get our word pornography. And the word he meant to use was meant to cover all kinds of forbidden sexual relationships, deviant behavior. The focus, again, being on the dysfunction that's in our hearts that pursues pornea. Sex was also used in their pagan worship rituals in a very unhealthy way. There were rituals and rites that involved types of sexual acts and sacrifice. And Paul wanted to be clear that in Christianity, there was no room for this type of behavior. These were not a part of Christian worship. And then in verse 20, Paul lists sins of spirituality, idolatry and witchcraft. Now, we all know about idolatry, right? It's the worship of anything that we have that's other than God. And we all openly struggle with this one. We have things that we value very greatly in this world, and we worship them. Our cars, our homes, our bank accounts, our savings accounts. There are also things we worship without realizing it by arranging our lives around it. We refuse invitations and stay home to indulge, or we plan extra time to do the things we want to do before going and helping. We must stay alert to the things in our lives that take our time and our attention and our heart. Next, Paul talks about witchcraft because of the heart of what witchcraft is about. Witchcraft stems from the desire to manipulate and to control the things of this world. The word witchcraft in the Greek that Paul used here comes from the word pharmakeia. Now, we get our word pharmacy for this word, which also makes sense because don't people use drugs to manipulate and distort their reality that they live in when they abuse them? Drugs can be used to help their healthy ways, but as we know, we abuse them as well. So Paul is saying to us, there are no shortcuts. There are no quick fixes, no room for manipulating God here. The next sins that Paul talks about are social sins. These are the sins that cause chaos and war in our world. They pit us against each other. God made us to be in relationship with each other, and sin fundamentally changed who we are. So now we think of ourselves more than others. And these sins, they fracture the unity and relationship that God had intended for us. So Paul points out that these particular sins may be personal, but they ripple out into the world around us. And the last group of sins that Paul brings to our attention are sins of excess. And we know these all too well, right? If a little is good, a lot must be great. You can get too much of a good thing, you know. All of these sins manifest themselves in self-centered behavior or egocentric ways. We say more for me. Sins of excess leave no room for the spirit to work or for us to care for others. Now, because we are a people who are led by our own desires, we try to deal with our own sin by handling ourselves. And in order to do that, what we like to do is alter our reality so that we can live within our sinful choices. And one of the biggest ways that we do that is through denial. We say that just isn't true. My grandfather used to smoke, and he also used to say that quitting was easy. He did it all the time. (laughs) We walk around pretending that we are in control of our vices. Now, we studied self-control last week. How did that go for you? How many times did you find your self-control lacking in this world? John, or excuse me, yes, John 3.20 tells us that everyone who does evil hates the light and does not come into the light for fear that his deeds will be exposed. We don't want to shine in the light too brightly on certain areas of our lives. As long as we leave those areas in the dark, nobody will see them and we can pretend and deny their existence. We can lie to ourselves all we want, but we cannot lie to our God. He knows our truth. A second way that we deal with sin is through legalism. We say that there's rules and there's laws and that's how we monitor them. And what this means for some people is that they kind of have gotten holier than thou. 
They see the rules they follow and they're very haughty about it, but they see the sins of others very quickly, seldom recognizing the sins in themselves. Matthew reminds us of this shortcoming in Matthew 7. Why do you look at the speck that is in your brother's eye, but do not notice the log that is in your own eye? Or how can you say to your brother, let me take the speck out of your eye, and behold, the log is in your own? Legalism helps us feel better about ourselves in the beginning. But the longer we leave that plank in our eye, the more irritated our eye becomes, and it causes us to lose our ability to see. Third, we like excuses to justify our sin. Nothing helps us accept our sin more than when we justify its existence and say it's okay. How many things has our culture come to consider normal that used to be taboo? And why is that? Have we just gotten worn down and used to sin so it doesn't even faze us anymore? And there's also this misnomer that God forgives us, so why worry about sin? He'll forgive us anyways. Paul tells us in Romans, what shall we say then? Are we to continue in sin that grace may abound? By no means. How can we who died to sin still live in it? Saying the devil made me do it is no longer a valid excuse. We have been given the spirit and he loudly tells us what is and isn't okay. If we listen. And lastly, sometimes our sin becomes acceptable to us because we simply give up. We have hopelessness and despair. There are folks who have been beat down so many times or have fallen down that they don't believe they can get up anymore. We read last week about the Apostle Paul's struggle with his sin, how he hated the things that he did that he knew were sinful and he couldn't overcome them. But if we stay in that despair, we give up. And when we give up, we succumb to sin. And when we succumb to sin, we deny God. Despair is not the answer to our sin. Romans 8, 2 reminds us that we have been set free from the judgment of sin. Christ died for you to have this privilege. And his dying gives us life, not despair. So we cannot control or corral or tend to our sin through denial, legalism, making excuses, or despair. Sin is real. It is active, and it requires that kind of response. Christ's death has set us free and empowered us to be better, to do better. And the answer, Paul says, is to live by the fruits of the Spirit. And when a person follows these characteristics, they are following the characteristics of Christ, and they shine through them when we let the Spirit take control. And we love the world the way Jesus did, with peace, with kindness, with gentleness. It's as though we've gotten supernatural help somehow to be better. Oh, yeah, we have, haven't we? God has provided the spirit for us to have victory over the sinful desires of our flesh. And that is a double-edged sword for us. Because he tells us, now those who belong to Christ Jesus have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. On the one hand, we, it's good to know God has our back, right? We have strength and we have power that we didn't have before. We have wisdom we didn't have before. But the other side of this is now we know better. So we're without excuse when we indulge our sin. And lastly, Paul gives us warnings of other ways that we try to manage our guilt over sin. We boast about the things that we're good at to excess, to cover up for our sin and the things that we are not good at. And sometimes our self-loathing for sin is taken out on others, challenging them in their ways instead of dealing with our own. And perhaps because of envy, we are harsher on others than we should be. Paul says those who belong to Jesus Christ have crucified this kind of behavior and no longer behave this way. Do you feel that war waging inside of you, that good versus evil? It's like a new ache or, or a new pain or a new sore. We notice it, but we kind of hope it'll just go away. But over time, we learn that our sin does not just go away, nor does our conflict with sin. Instead, it grows as we grow, and our tests become more difficult as we mature. 
Living with the fruit of the Spirit and overcoming the desires of our flesh requires two steps. First, we need to stop denying, justifying, ignoring our sin. We need to nail our sin to a cross. And you know that won't be easy. You know you will feel those nails like Jesus did when you tried to give up your sin. Second, choose wisely to daily walk in the Spirit, as Paul says. Choose a life that is led not by your own desires, but by those of Christ. Since I live in the Spirit, I shall now walk in the Spirit, should be our mantra. Let the Spirit inside of you go first in all things. Put your desires second. Retrain your brain and walk in the Spirit because you cannot do that on your own. Do you remember Peter getting out of the boat and walking on water with Jesus? Woohoo, look at me. And the moment he took his eyes off the Lord, what happened? He fell. We need our eyes on God. Only the Spirit can empower us to overcome our desires. You can be strong in the battle and you can win if you remember you have strength from God. Christ lives in us. And if we abide in them, we will bear much fruit. John 15, 5. I am the vine, you are the branches. Let the life of Christ flow through you and embrace the power of of the Holy Spirit. He is the vine. You are the branch. And only by his power can you overcome your sin and have victory over the conflict. Let's pray. Gracious and holy God, thank you for your love, for the gift of these fruits that give us such strength and power, Lord. For we are weak. We are broken by ourselves. But we feel you in us. We feel the power we hear the voice. Lord, help us to lean on that instead of ourselves. Give us the power to love this world, to bring joy and peace and kindness and gentleness into it, and to respond with self-control. We ask for your power to be with us always and give you all praise and thanks in Jesus' name. Amen. Thanks for tuning in, and I'll talk to you soon. Take care.